Hi, Steve Van Meter here and welcome to your weekly economic update where we take about 30 minutes to take a deeper dive into the economy and the markets to see if we can figure out what's going on. And aren't things getting interesting? The trade war looks like it's becoming a currency war. That's not good for anybody, but it certainly appears that way. And what's even more interesting is how many people that are retired or near retirement have sunk all of their money into stocks. Sort of makes you nervous, doesn't it? Makes me nervous because I'm glad I'm not one of those. The content of this video is provided as educational information only. It's not intended to provide investment or other advice. This show is not to be construed as a recognition or solicitation by a silly security financial instrument or to participate in any particular trading strategy. This video was paired by Stephen Van Meter on personal capacity. Opinions expressed video that I do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advisors Inc. or Stephen Van Meter Financial. Wow. <laughs> you know, I thought today was just going to be boring Friday in the markets. There's this kind of joke that there's, it's called risk-free Fridays where markets just go up on Friday, no matter what, close higher and go into the weekend. Didn't happen. Couldn't have predicted this. Yes, I seem slightly abused because what else is there really to say? Let's start out with how things ended. So yesterday, Thursday, markets closed lower. And then probably within an hour to two hours of the futures market opening, which they open at uh, 4 p.m. Pacific, yesterday's loss magically erased. Crazy, but that's what happened. No news, just people or computers moving the market up. Okay, so it was just right on track with risk-free Friday, and we're going to get this notion that Jerome Powell's going to come out and... Uh, say he's going to ease a lot, which is not what the Fed does at the Jackson Hole meeting. But hey, the markets want to be bullish. Fine. No big deal. Markets can do what the markets want to do. But what did China do before markets open in a very President Trump-like move, who has always waited to announce uh, tariffs right before the Chinese markets open, announced that they're going to escalate the trade war by increasing the tariffs on us effective September 1st and do us what we'll say is called a second tranche on December 15th to match ours. This is very, very interesting. In this, you have to look at this negotiation as becoming a fight. We're going from a trade war to a currency war. So let's look at what happened. President Trump said, I'm gonna ante up the next level. I'm gonna put some tariffs on September 1st. Before he officially announced exactly the details of it, from what we know, his team at the White House or his cabinet, or I'm not sure who exactly, convinced him that that would not be the best idea going into the holiday season. Hard to disagree with that because, you know, Americans like to buy stuff for uh, holidays and certainly tariffs would slow that down a bit, even though it takes some time for the tariffs to filter through because tariffs are only counted on things that haven't shipped. And since most things come over on cargo ships, it takes quite a long time. So it wouldn't have probably a huge impact, but it certainly would. It would certainly have an impact, but how much it would is hard to say. Well, shortly after that, and we talked about this in a video, China came out and said, aha, sign of weakness. He backed off. And then China did nothing, which was, Kind of odd, except they said, we've got something for you. But that was it. And so everyone went along and, you know, here we hear from President Trump how great the economy is. And yet at the same time, he's telling the Fed to cut. And you've probably heard this in the news, but it bears repeating. If the economy is so strong, why does the Fed need to cut? It doesn't make any sense. It only does make sense if you understand that President Trump needs the Fed to help him fight this trade war. And the Fed doesn't want to do that as we've talked about, because if the Fed says, I will join pres the pre any president, not just Trump, but a president, a, a sitting president, and I will help them fight trade wars, the Fed will lose their independence. The dollars in term as it stands to the reserve currency will change and it will tank. And then we will have massive inflation and the Fed will be forced to tighten. That's what happens. So what did the Fed do? And I I'm going to have to tip my hat to Jerome Powell on this one because before they were coming out and they were jawboning the market up. Every time the market down, ah, oh, send a bunch of Fed speakers out, talk it up, talk it up. And what did he do? He put a gag order 
on all voting members of the Fed. Don't talk. Because the non-voting members can say what they want. Nobody cares because they're non-voting members. They don't have any authority. They don't have, they, they, they don't make policy. They're a non-voting member. Bold strategy considering, as we've discussed, he is probably out of a job if President Trump is reelected. And there's a fair chance he's out of a job if a Democrat's elected. But what he doesn't want is to sink the ship with the dollar. Now, he doesn't want the dollar to go too high, but he doesn't want the dollar to crash because then he has to hike, has to and go back to quantitative tightening. So this morning, China comes out and says, we got more tariffs for you, buddy. See how you think about that. And why did they do it? Because it's a sign. They think, look, China is hurting. If you don't think they are, their people don't have enough food to eat. They got hit by the fall army worm, some other worm, and they killed off somewhere between 40 to 50% of their hogs. And they eat a lot of pork. And guess what we have? We have a lot of food. It's like, should be buddy, buddy, right? We got something you want. You got something we want. Let, let's figure it out. But China's willing to shoot themselves in the foot to win. They're not happy. So they came out this morning, as I mentioned, put some more tariffs on. And President Trump was too busy hammering Powell uh, because the Fed chair Powell did, did not indicate he was going to lower rates. He shouldn't. This wasn't the appropriate meeting. This is not an FOMC meeting. This is just the, the Fed's vacation where they invite other central bankers and discuss monetary policy. He did say that he would do what it takes to keep things accommodative. But he also mentioned that inflation was rising toward their 2% goal. So he's trying to say, look, I may not cut. Now, the reality is he's going to cut. We'll get to that in a minute. So President Trump turned around and said a short while later, oh yeah, I've got something for you, China. I'm going to respond in the afternoon after stock market closes. He does this deliberately because he doesn't want to spook the markets, especially even any worse than they were already spooked. So now we have a problem. The Fed isn't going to support the president, which they shouldn't. It's not their job. Their job isn't not to pander to Congress or the president, although the Congress is their official boss. They're supposed to be independent. But we know a month from now at the next FOMC meeting that they're going to be forced to cut because the other central bankers are cutting. And when other central bankers cut and you're the reserve currency and you don't cut, your currency appreciates in value. And the last thing the U.S. economy needs right now is further tightening from a stronger dollar. He's going to have to cut. But what we don't know is what President Trump's going to do. Now, at the time of recording, there has not been an announcement, so I have no idea. And it could, for all I know, it's being announced right now or in five minutes. I don't know. There are fears that he will devalue the dollar. I don't know what he's going to do. Maybe he'll increase the tariffs. Maybe he'll roll the, the December 15th tariffs to September. No idea. But what I can tell you is tariffs lead to currency wars. And currency wars lead to what's called a hot war. Shooting war. <laughs> usually. Maybe we won't. I don't know. But it's not good. So you have the situation now where you have a game of chicken being played. You know, you have two cars, China and the U.S. going at each other, two big egos, both sides. Because look, if President Trump backs off and capitulates, what's, what, what's going to stand his election, re-election chances? Well, same with, and same with President Z. He's not going up for re-election ever because he can't. He's elected for life. But how will that look to his people if he backs off now? It's a problem. And a lot of people got crammed into stocks because they were told the market's going to go up forever. Yikes. So I still think the Fed's going to cut. That still should be our game plan. I, it, it, yeah, it's just one of those things. What do you say? You got everybody in stocks and we're gonna have a big trade war. The Fed's got this 18 month lag in tightening. The Treasury is gonna borrow a bunch of money starting next month. Growth rate of the M2 money supply slowed to 5.49% on an annualized basis. The six month rate of change was up a little bit. Three month rate of change was starting to fall. Three month rate of change is obviously going to lead the six and 12 month. So this is probably peaking out now that um, we know the Treasury is going to need to start borrowing soon uh, as of next month, and uh, that will drag the money supply back down. Looking at commercial industrial lending growth rates up to 6.85% from this time a year ago. Uh, the short term was about half a percent. Last week, it's a little over 1%. 
I don't think you're gonna see a lot of lending now. There's a lot of uncertainty when a president says, look, companies, bring your factories home. We don't need China, we can win this. If you're a corporate executive of a major company, you're gonna cut your spending fast. You're gonna start worrying about your supply chain. You're probably gonna start cutting your, your share buybacks. Consumers are gonna start worrying. It just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Look, I, I, let me rephrase I'm not trying to say what President Trump is doing is right or wrong. It's his own business. He has the power and authority to do what he's doing. What I'm saying is, from an economic standpoint, I'm a business, a large business, it doesn't make sense to look at expansion. Not now. There's too much uncertainty. That's what stocks don't like. Looking at consumers who've been uh, a little charging up their credit cards a little bit lately, it's down to 4.23%. Actually, it should be ups. It was up slightly. Last minute edit. Looking at the volatility index against the 10-year, two-year yield curve. This is where you take 10-year yields to track two years, and you advance by 36 months, and you can see the volatility should be back up at some point where it was in 07, 08. That means stock market decline is coming. And you can see that happened actually back in 2000. Uh, thank you for Nordea Markets and Macrobond for putting this chart up on Twitter. Now, I don't know who posted this one, but this is a move index, which is vol bond volatility against the VIX index, equity volatility. I said bonds lead uh, equity volatility, and boom, bond volatility is rising. Tells us at some point equity volatility is going to spring higher. And we can also look at the bond yield stock correlation. I think this came from zero head. So stocks and bond yields are normally correlated except ahead of recessions and corrections. And we can look back in 2006 to seven, uh, right before the great financial crisis, we can see before the 2016 uh, correction, and we can see some little ones here. And now we've got one of the biggest ones building right now. I've said 10 year treasury yields are headed to zero, uh, and I may have hinted that I actually really think they're headed negative. A lot of people may struggle with that. So, but the reality is, if Europe's interest rates can go negative, and Japan's can go negative, and other, other major industrial countries can go negative, so can ours. And if you look at a regression channel, which says in order to ease financial conditions, 10-year treasury yields need to go below zero. Big return for bond owners. Why do you think people are buying a negative yielding government debt? Look, it's not because they think there's someone dumber than they are that's gonna buy it from them. They believe that deflation is coming. And that's what happens in a debt-based economy when you get too much debt and not enough growth you get deflationary shocks. And in that case, you want no one in negative yielding bonds, cool. Just gotta make sure you know when to sell it. So US has the highest yields of the major industrialized nations. And I assume at some point there'll be a flood of money coming into here. Here's another regression channel going back to 1990. And you can see yields, up. this, is, this one's a little out of date because yields are actually 10 years a little below this. But again, it's suggesting that they're gonna have to get to zero or below. And then I think this is the last chart. We have GDP versus the market manufacturing flash PMI, which is showing that US GDP is likely headed lower, not higher. And for all those who are hoping that corporations are gonna keep uh, propping up stock prices by buying their stock back, and the biggest one is Apple and how much longer they're gonna be able to do this, I don't know, but they're really the ones that are holding the market up. But we can see buybacks are falling and this was as of the second quarter, and I would suspect that as uncertainty continues to make its way through the news, the corporations are going to further reduce their buybacks and focus on bringing their balance sheet, their debts down, because as uncertainty hits the economy, everybody stops spending. I mean, that's kind of just how it works. Okay, let's go on to, oh, 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 you know, I wanna talk about, all right. I have slightly misreported, but only because the report was not accurate enough to accurately report. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics is indeed going to reduce the non-farm payroll count, count down by 500,000 jobs. They're not gonna do it till next year. I think February next year, they think they said. And it is the 12 month period to March, 2019. Now I have that data. So let's go look at it. So here we have all the payroll data. This, he, this column here is the actual reported data. So let's go back to 
12 month period up to March. Now they're going to adjust this right off of the March number. That's what they said. They're they're going to they could go back to and even it out, but they're going to just knock it right off the March report for whatever reason. That's what they're going to do. But you can see down here they estimated 2.5 million jobs. That's going to drop to 2 million. Here is the number of made up jobs that the BLS did. So we got 12. Whoops. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, that is correct. Let's go. So the BLS estimated there was 976,000 jobs created that they couldn't count. Well, they were off by a lot. So the actual number will be 476,000 jobs they made up that they may have found after all. Just as I said, the payroll reports are nowhere near as good as the BLS said. But the market doesn't care about that because it's old news now. The BLS is not gonna report it until next year. And the market is gonna be, hey, that's cool, no big deal. It is a big deal, half a million fewer jobs, 40,000 jobs a month less. Let's take a look at what the banks are up to. Uh, I was a little concerned about last week because the reason interest rates on the 30 year backed up a little bit was because the large banks had cut some of their mortgage bond holdings. Where, uh, here. So they had cut that, but this week they increased their total bond holdings by 24 billion. Uh, we can see six and nine, 15 billion in treasury securities and 9 billion in mortgage back. Am I in the wrong? Yep, there it is. What did I just say? 15 billion in mortgage backed securities. And my eyes seem a little off today. Treasury and age. Oh, non. Okay, that's because I got this backwards. And $9 billion in treasury securities. I wish they just call these treasury securities. They throw, threw me off there. So they're backed by mortgages. That's good. Supports our position on what we want to do. Let's take a look at the NASI, the NASDAQ McClellan Summation Index. A, a good. Uh, Indicator for market liquidity, I'm going to guess this is going to drop um, tomorrow when they update this based on today's market. Just showing liquidity conditions are tight. Going into September, they're going to get a lot tighter. And then as for our farmers, so the U. So I was I didn't know who this pro farm tour was. It turns out it's 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 the USDA. So the USDA every year around this time sends out teams and they have particular routes and they go to the same fields and they pull you know, ears of corn and yank up some soybeans and they count everything and measure them and size them and all the things to get a more accurate picture of yields and production. Now in some parts of the country, in the best parts, the crops look great. No problem, no, no, no. But everywhere else, man, not looking so hot. They're small, uh, ears of corn are missing, you know, the ends are not growing. They're just not that mature. Same problem with soybeans in soybean world. I, obviously they don't have kernels on them, yeah. Anyways, it doesn't look like the crop is going to come in quite as rosy as the USDA has suggested. And farmers who are not very happy about a lot of things right now, and you don't blame them, have said they need hot weather and dry weather, and they need it for five weeks straight to keep their crops where they need them so they can mature. Well, we know because a couple of days ago, rain's going to hit there or it's hitting there or going to be hitting there. Look at this massive cold front. It's going to be right smack in the middle of the, the growing region in the next week. Fortunately, they're not going to see a whole lot of rain, at least up in here. So that will make farmers happier, the below average precipitation. And then going out to the 8 to 14 day forecast, more, it's still colder. Well, it's not super cold, but look, they need hot, dry. They need this over here. But the good news is, for now, they're not seeing any more rain. And the, the Pro Farm Tour did mention that certain parts of the, certain areas, parts of the country, had too much moisture. And that wasn't good for the crops. So all this is still setting up the notion that probably before the next payroll port, my hunch, so sometime in the next two weeks, I'll go ahead and rebalance the portfolios. I have not decided exactly when. I'm gonna assume that we need to see what President Trump's going to say. If now he again, he may be saying it right now as I'm, I'm recording this. I don't know, but it'd be really interesting if he's devaluing the dollar. That would change some things. So, no point in front running any news. But I have a hunch that the next payroll report is not going to be that great, 
and uh, we probably want to be in position before that that's kind of what my thoughts are so let's go to the charts and see the bloodbath that was today so the s p 500 after getting back up now you notice it's range band here so it's bouncing right between this spot right here so it gets up here gets rejected gets rejected down here it goes back up again i I don't think the bulls are out of this yet. I, I still think they're in it. But nevertheless, we're now back below where we were in January 2018. So no money's being made in the market except uh, Wall Street who's charging fees, I'm no doubt. Uh, and taking a look at the NASDAQ, it too got hit, mainly because of Apple. Again, I'm not picking on Apple. I don't own any Apple products. I have no stake in Apple's game. I've, I've owned their products in the past, just didn't meet the needs that I, I need, um, but I have no problem with them. Their stock, however, does matter because not only is it one of the largest positions in the major indices, they're buying back just tremendous amounts of stock. Remember, they bought 17 billion between here and here, $17 billion of money flushed down the toilet. And again, bam, they're back down. So they, they were getting out of this symmetrical triangle and then came back down, back up out of it, back down, back up. And I said, look, this is a sell zone. If you don't know what a sell zone is, it means people are selling anywhere, anytime Apple prices get, say, over $210, sell, 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 right in there. There you go. That's what they're up to. And then today, probably because of Chinese tariffs, this is obviously going to impact Apple. Now, on the other hand, remains on what is this bizarre one, two, three, potential four top uh, tagged as 200 day moving average held there. The Russell 2000, this thing is a disaster waiting to lead the market lower. Whoops. Let's go to the 10 year. And you can see this is a big topping pattern. Let me make it a little easier to see. So you get this big topping pattern here, followed by a second topping pattern here. So the Russell breaks through here, should get down to 1350, breaks there. And your next level, I mean, you've got some support here at uh, 12, or at this point here, 1270. But your next area where there's a lot of price traded is down here at the 1240. I mean, this is a big, pretty big move down for the Russell. Uh, let's take a look at the VIX index. So volatility sprung off of its 50-day moving average. Like I, I still think the market's going to try to reverse this thing back down. And let's look at the, the ETF VXX. Again, don't trade this, don't buy it, don't sell it, don't short it, don't long it, don't, in, you can look at it, but don't think anything beyond this. Uh, it, it sprung higher today as people were hedging their short vol positions, but this market is very, very short volatility. And the other factor you've got here is corporations aren't blacked out until the Fed meeting next month, which is pretty interesting. I've got the chart on it. I, I don't remember who posted it, but I appreciate whoever put it together. So you've got next month, Corporate share buy, buy, buyback blackouts, which at some point will matter because when you see corporations are buying less stock, you know, the treasury gonna borrow a bunch of money. The Fed's gonna have to cut because they don't wanna be, they don't wanna watch the dollar get too strong. They really don't. So their other central banks are gonna cut. They're gonna have to. The global economy is pretty weak in Asia and Europe. I mean, Germany's unadmittedly in a recession. They, they announced this week that they weren't, but I mean, seriously, they are. It's ugly what's going on there. So the reality is, I still think U.S. investors got a few weeks up to that Powell meeting, the next FOMC meeting, to try to bring this thing back down one last time. And what we want to capitalize on that and take on uh, rebounds portfolios, pick up those last longer term bonds, ditch the short term bonds for that. Uh, they've done what we needed them to do, and I'm pretty happy about that. So let's take a look at 10 year treasury yields, and you can see they're flirting with their all-time lows. They hit resistance up here, let's zoom in, and you can see they hit resistance, rejected resistance. I thought they were gonna get out of this zone, and then bam, today, nope, didn't do it. I mean, I really thought, even 30 years, I was thinking uh, last night, I'm like, man, this thing's gonna get up to 2-2, two, which I was, it's not often you own something and you want it to go down in value, but I wanna buy more. <laughs> so, I was kind of rooting for it to go, the yields to go up a little bit more as because I'm like, hey, this would be a good opportunity to, I mean, if it got to 2-2, two, two, I was like, man, I'm going to, that, I would rebalance the portfolio. Like if it got there today, I'd probably be rebalancing it early next week, but um, got rejected a resistance. 
again, a lot of people still believe in the broad narrative that the trade war will be ending soon and all this is gonna go away. A lot of volume on the S&P 500 today, no surprise there as a lot of positions were moved around. Let's look at gold. I don't know why the trade war is bullish for gold because it shouldn't be, it's not inflationary. It does cause consumer prices to rise, but in terms of actual money, currency printing inflation, which is what gold's supposed to be a hedge against, it doesn't really do that. So gold just kind of got back up where its prior tops were and the mining stocks, well, they pretty much did the same. The large DX got up here. This trade is just way overextended. There's, there's way too many people playing in this camp. And if prices that, since prices aren't breaking out, it tells us they still need to reverse. The silver miners got up back to where they were and even the junior miners, they couldn't get back up to their recent highs. Again, we'll see the the um, hedge fund positioning on Monday. We'll take a look at that. I imagine they're still extended over there too. And I'm really dying and curious to see if they went even more short on those treasury bonds. That's why I said, I just I just want to go up. This yields up a little bit because everyone's so short. Just throw me some candy. I don't see what the big deal is. Uh, here we are, TLT, position in the portfolio. Also got SHY. It's kind of nudging, it's not back at its all time highs, but it's getting really close to breaking out on the Fed cutting, which they should do. Uh, TLT, the long bond has, see this orange line? Now I put this orange dotted line right at the all time high, because what happened is it broke over the all time high, came back, reconfirmed it, got went back up, came back down, reconfirmed it, started to go down. Again, I thought it was gonna come down here and re-tag its 50 day moving average. See, I'm not putting out the, this can't still happen. I mean, it, it could take off, but what, at the moment, there's just still too many people that are wanting to be short treasuries for that to happen. Let's take a look at the dollar. We got hammered today. Uh, big rejection on the dollar at resistance here. But again, with other central banks cutting ahead of the Fed, it, it implies dollar strength. So we'll, again, we'll be curious to see what President Trump uh, does. Uh, let's take a look at crude oil because China did say they're going to put tariffs on crude imports. Now, this is real simple. You say, why would they do that? They don't need our oil. Where do you think they're getting it from? Iran? <gasps> yes. Do you think they care about U.S. tariff or U.S. sanctions? They don't. <laughs> Not for a second. So they're going to tariff U.S. oil. Smart move on their part because we're producing a massive amount, I think record production of oil and all these little companies in the Permian need a uh, $54 barrel oil to survive, and it's now under 54 barrel. There are already bankruptcies starting over there. There will be more, especially if crude oil continues to fall, and it should. And looking at the small oil producers, which is what uh, XOP does here, you can see it's flirting almost right back with its all-time lows, below the lows back in, uh, what, 2016? And you can see almost back at all time lows. This has got a lot of downward momentum, but I think it could be a big buying opportunity when this thing gets near zero, which is where it's likely headed. Uh, lumber broke down, a sign of inflation. Well, lumber would tell you, nope. Ag commodities, again, this is a surprise because China's really not buying here. So this is one of those computer algorithm short programs, I'm guessing, because they're just reading that China's gonna tariff more, but they're really not buying hardly anything from us at the moment. And we'll see how the weather does and how the crops do. But this thing is battered and beat up so bad that it's, it's got to be close to the bottom. I mean, usually when things get low enough, the party's over. Now, where is the risk in the market? Uh, that Well, let's look, at, oh, let's look at emerging markets real quick. See, not down to their buy zone yet. Getting close. Kind of keep an eye on that. It's GE. GE could be the spark that blows this market apart. And see all this volume right here? A lot of GE insiders, corporate executives, openly came out and said, we bought. Because they know if GE stock continues to fall, their bonds are going to get downgraded to junk. If they get downgraded, their stock's going to fall, and that downgrade is going to bring the rest of the market down with them. GE's in bad place. Uh, and even PG&E... And, is looking pretty terrible here. People are trying to come in and buy this drop here, but PG&E is probably headed back down to its lows or even lower. There's a lot of problems there. But you can see the market is mainly being held up right now by Apple. And Apple announced they have a new iPhone coming out. It is a product refresh. It's not a, a whole new generation. And uh, if they don't sell a lot of that, 
well, maybe they can buy a lot of their stock back. So money will be interesting because I should have, well, not only we'll see how the hedge funds are positioned, but we'll also know uh, what President Trump's response is. Maybe he'll wait until um, Sunday night, we'll see, before China's market opens. But nevertheless, banks back buying those long-term mortgage bonds, which puts downward pressure on long-term yields. That's what we want. Fed cuts makes buying bonds the easiest trade on the market. I'm Steve Ammeter. Hope you have a great weekend. We'll be back at you Monday night. Bye now.